So I'd like to begin with a question. When did you personally first encounter the Psalms? If you have a recollection, what was that like? What might your first encounter have been? So if you had the privilege of going to Armenian school, you may be familiar with this prayer. Did you know this was from the Psalms? I remember being taught this prayer in Armenian school, and no one let me in on that secret, um, or that piece of knowledge that maybe we should have all known all along. And it came as a great surprise to me. So here we have um, and this is our, our first little foray into looking at some of the variations with Psalms. So here we have on the top left, the Karapar, the classical Armenian. And then on the right, we have the translation of the classical Armenian. And then we have the King James Version. And I know the King James Version has kind of fallen out of favor, but if people, if English speakers have um, knowledge of Psalms memorized. It's often from that version. So I'm using that um, here tonight. And also just to point out, we can look at some of these differences. Um, they may not be they may not be huge, but they are noticeable. Uh, and perhaps the first one, we have this in English, we have establish. Establish the work of our hands. And in Armenian, it's very different. Urir. Urir ara imez, as kores as sirats middles. Make right, make upright, make straight. And I included all of these, these multiplicities here for your consideration. Um, we don't do this normally when we're translating. We don't give you multiple options. But really, this is a key part of Armenian scripture interpretation. Whereas the Western mind may seek to funnel down and distill one possible interpretation of a word or a verse, Armenian tends to go the other direction and it opens out. And if there's a mul multiplicity of possibilities, interpreters will often use all of them rather than settling on just one. And so they may say, make, our, make the works of our hands right. Make the works of our hands upright straighten out the works of our hands. And when we pray this, we can do the same. Which meaning do we need most in any given moment? So this may or may not have been your first introduction to the Psalms. And I wonder if this is familiar to anybody here. I know it certainly is to our deacon seminarian. Amen. <speaking in Hebrew> Amen. I wonder if this is familiar to anyone. Many of us, if we are at the beginning and even before the beginning of Badarak, these are the words we will hear the priest say. May God who loves humankind receive psalmody and supplications for the pleasure of his beneficent will. May he grant forgiveness for our sins and manifold transgressions. May he deliver us from evils. May he preserve us from harm. And to him glory forever. Amen. And then these very familiar words that begin Badarak. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit now and always, and unto eternities of eternities. Amen. And I think it's significant that the rendering in Armenian 
the very first word is psalmody, psalm singing. This is the first word that is uttered as we begin our Babarak journey every Sunday. Sometimes this little machtank, this supplication gets left out, but it should be a part of our Babarak experience. I can't hear it. And if this was less than familiar, I suspect this will be familiar to all of us. I wonder how many of us maybe know this as the church is over song. Church is over now. Time to go home. Time to go home. Well, it has a greater meaning than that. And yes, as kids, we, we know that this signals the end of Babarak. But it's really a beginning rather than an ending. I shall bless the Lord at all times. At all times, his blessing is in my mouth. These are the last words of the Babarak. These are the last words as we prepare to now having been nourished by spiritual communion to go back out into the world, to be a light in the world. And again, I've put here both the, the, the top English is the rendering from Armenian, and then the, the bottom is from the King James. Slight differences, but again, it's, it's just worthy to notice some of these differences. So we start Badarak with Psalms and Psalm singing. We end Badarak and begin our week with psalms and psalm singing. So not only do we have beginning and end of Badarak, but we actually make the words of the psalms our own at different points. So when we go up to kiss the gospel at the end of Badarak, it's customary for the person going up to say, der Badarak is ko. May the Lord remember all of your offerings and make your gifts acceptable. So we say this to the priest. This comes directly from Psalm 19.4. And the priest, the celebrant, responds, May the Lord grant to you according to your heart and may he fulfill all your aspirations. So these are words that are probably familiar to many of us. And again, I confess, I said them for years before I realized they came from the Psalms. And this is, I think, very reminiscent of something, of some of what um, Arpi shared with us last week, how the words of the Psalms were the words that Christ used to speak to God at the crucifixion, at least if not elsewhere. And here we make the words of the Psalms our own as well. So the Psalms, we can see them as, um, you know, life is full of scripts. I don't, if you've done anything with communication, you, you realize that we live with a lot of scripts in life. If I say, hi, how are you? You have a, you have a scripted response that you don't even have to think about. And that applies to our, Spiritual lives as well. We have scripts. These are scripts that were scripted by the Holy Spirit. And we get to use them in different ways. And this is one of them. And a second is when we receive mass. Now, this has fallen a little bit out of tradition. But it's customary for the person distributing mass to say, Mas and yev pajin yeriti kez isur badarakis. May this be your portion and share of this holy babarak, this holy sacrifice. And the recipient, when receiving the mass on their hand, says, Hajin im asvats habidya. May God be my portion forever. And again, this is right out of Psalm, Psalm 72, second half of verse 26. We're going to spend a lot of time later on in this course looking at how the Psalms get used in Badarak. It's one of our last sessions, but this just gives you a little bit of a, um, 
a foretaste of what is to come. And for you to think about as we um, celebrate Baldarak on a, on a weekly basis, to think about the ways that the Psalms are part and parcel of our interaction with the Babarak. Uh, and these are just a few, few key examples. Um, and this is not to mention all of the other ways the Psalms get used in Babarak, not to mention the other services. But to that end, just to give you a little idea, this is four of the seven daily services and all of the examples of Psalms that get used in them. So you can see there is a rich usage of the Psalms in the daily hours. Again, we have seven daily hours, starting with Kishirayin in the wee hours of the morning, going throughout the day to the last seventh hour, Hankastyam. And these seven hours, just keep that number seven in mind. Um, I'm sure it raises uh, thoughts for many of us, the number seven, and it's going to come in a little bit later tonight. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how the Psalms have been assimilated and inculcated in the Armenian spiritual psyche. We know that Psalms were being recited before the Bible was translated in the fifth century. So they were probably one of the first things to have been received orally and to have been um, translated and transmitted. And as a result, we know there were different translations of the Psalms. People heard them different ways. Um, and I bring to you this little couplet from a litany that comes out of night service, Kishiramin. Um, in each service, we have series of litanies. And in Kishirain, we have one, depending on the tone of the day, there are eight tones. So each day is assigned a tone. And this is part of one of those litanies. So we have Vasen Vork Ilerines Haides Yevipabares Penagialen Sur Parken Mer Zdera Gacestsuk. Those of our holy fathers who have dwelled in mountains, caves, and rocky clefts. Let us beseech the Lord. And then immediately following, Vasen Vork Savmosyu Yev Or Nutyam, Gadaren Zamenain Jamanagas Genats Yurians Azder Arachis Tsuk. For those who carry the entirety, carry out the entirety of their lives in Psalms and in blessing, let us beseech the Lord. And I think these two go, go somewhat hand in hand based on um, what we know about how some of the Psalms were recited antiphonally. Uh, it's not unlikely that the Holy Fathers who were living in these crevices were some of those who spent their time saying the Psalms. And it's interesting if you look at the entirety of the litanies that are offered in this service, um, it's unusual to mention a class of people like this in this way. So it's significant that we're praying for those who are ostensibly um, living like literally living lives of prayer. They are living prayers themselves. Uh, and we so we pray this once every eight days or so in the cycle of liturgical worship. And whenever we come up to this, I often wonder to myself, is there anybody out there right now who prays the Psalms perpetually in our tradition? There certainly is in other traditions. And, you know, might we be some of those people from time to time, whether it's 24 hours a day or whether it's um, on a regular basis that the, the rhythm of the Psalms, the words of the Psalms are part and parcel of our daily lives, part and parcel of our spirituality, and especially part of our conversation, our ongoing conversation with God. So I really love this litany, and it's not one that most of us would have an opportunity to hear. Um, possibly you'd hear it on a Sunday morning if you attend morning service, but it's part of our inherited um, corporate prayer tradition to pray for those who, who occupy themselves with praying the Psalms and praying Orphanutyums, praying these blessing songs.
I wonder if this scene looks familiar to anybody. Um, it's not an atypical um, Armenian village. You see the mountains, you see barely in the forefront of the picture, you see um, possibly heads of wheat and uh, alluding to the agricultural um, surroundings of this, this town. This is modern day Zeytun. So Sulimania, this is perhaps where some of your forebears came from. And sometime after the Muslim conquest, we have accounts that um, Zetunsis would go out into their fields and would chant the Psalms back and forth to one another. So this was part of daily life for um, these individuals who likely would not have been literate. Would not have certainly would not have had access to a manuscript of the Psalms, but who would have, by osmosis, absorbed the Psalms into their being by hearing them at the uh, at the local monasteries at the church, and we have a, a similar um, parallel in the West where if you look at a rosary. The rosary has its origin in the Pater Noster, which is the Our Father. And this came down from the Psalms. So there was um, great value attributed to saying the Psalms. And in the West, peasants would do their best to try and hear what the Psalms were, and they were not always successful. And so the merit in hearing the song, in in reciting the psalms was transferred to saying the equivalent number of our fathers. So that eventually became what we know as the rosary today, but it has its origin in, um, in the common layperson attempting to uh, avail themselves of the value that was attributed to reciting the psalms. So they would have 150 beads or they'd have 50 beads that they would say three times, but that's where the number of prayers for the rosary today has its origin. And so here, maybe our Armenian forebears in places like Zaytun had a little more access to actually hearing the Psalms as they were chanted. Um, and so they were, they were using them on their own. And this, it's a little bit blurry, but this is a canyon in a village called Khnus. And this brings me back to that litany that I shared with you. Those who dwell in the crevices and in the rocky places, who occupy themselves with saying the Psalms, with, with praying the Psalms. And this is another region where there was a tradition of praying the Psalms antiphonally um, out and about. And again, we know that um, how they had preserved their psalms was not necessarily the textus receptus, the standard version that we're used to hearing in uh, in a monastery setting or in in uh, in looking at a text. So they made it, whether it was by accident or by mishearing or by intention, we may not know, but they had their own living version of the psalms. So we're going to look a little bit into um, one psalm this evening in particular. So this is what we call in Armenian the Hampatsi psalm. It's Psalm 120 by Armenian Reckoning. And this is uh, chanted in the evening service, Yerevoyanjam, every day. And so we'll give a try. It's a slightly different form of technology, um, but we'll see if this works. <laughs> I'm going to 
So a special thank you there to two of our seminarians here, Deacon Garen and Garo, for um, providing us with an example of how that antiphonal chanting, poch ni poch, back and forth chanting, takes place in a, in a chapel setting, in a church setting. This would be how the Psalms would be um, chanted back and forth. Presumably, this would have been similar to what might have taken place in the fields of Zetun or the uh, rocky crevices of Hanus. Um, and going from there, so we have here, um, I gave you the Armenian uh, words to follow along here. Let's see what I have for you next. Okay, so, so here we have uh, this is a sharagan. These are the words to a sharagan that um, the Hampatsi sharagan is one of, uh, sorry, the Hampatsi psalm is one of a few psalms that also have an entire body of sharagans that have been composed to correlate to the theme of this sharagan. And uh, we're going to talk about that concept quite a bit in later sessions, but this is just to give you a little taste. So we have, on a daily basis, you'd hear what we just heard. The two tosses of um, Tabirs would be chanting back and forth. And then immediately following that, we would move into the Amparsi Sharagan of that day. So it would depend on, is it a, is it a saint's commemoration day? Is it a fasting day? Is it a Sunday? Is it a uh, special Saturday? Is it Lent? Um, so all of these, there are quite a few sharagans that are composed specifically as hampatsi sharagans, and then a, a number of others that get used as hampatsi sharagans. And so I think, let me just see if I gave you... Oh. Hmm. I have hidden a slide from you that had the English for this somewhere. I think it's coming up later. So if you bear with me. Um, so here I'd like to thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, here I'd like to hopefully share with you a version of this Sharagan. Um, and I will look for thumbs ups to make sure that you can actually hear it. Okay, so I hope that was worth listening to. Um, it's a beautiful rendering of that particular Sharagan. And let's see if what, yes. Okay, so what I wanted to show you, here we have, um, on the left, we have the translation from the Armenian of the, of the Psalm that we looked at. So Psalm 120. And on the right, uh, again, we have the King James Version of this song. 
And so I thought this would be a good psalm for us to just kind of look at some of the differences that really come out in the Armenian verses, what we have in this English translation. And right from the first verse, we see some pretty significant differences. So in the Armenian, we have, I raised, past tense, my eyes to the mountains, whence help shall come to me. In the English, we have, I will lift up, future tense, my eyes unto the hills, not mountains, from whence comes my help, from whence cometh my help. And moving down uh, in terms of what some of the differences, if we look at the third verse here, give not your foot to trembling and may your guard not slumber, which is very different than the English here. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. So in the Armenian, we have sort of a, if you do this, then this will not happen. So if you do not give your foot to trembling, if you do not put your foot in a uh, unsteady uh, place, then the one who keeps you will not fall asleep. He's not going to fall asleep on the job of taking care of you. If you do put your foot there, it's a little up for debate whether he's going to take a little nap on you or not. So it's a very different feeling than um, than the English, where it's he will not. It's putting all of the action on God, presumably. God will not cause, he will not cause your foot to be moved. He will not fall asleep. But the Armenian, it's, we're involved. We're, we're partnered here. We have a role of uh, making sure we don't put our foot in one of those places. Um, and then moving down, we have, the Lord shall protect you and the Lord shall receive you with his right hand. Very different, again, from um, the what we have here in the English. The Lord is thy keeper. Okay, that's pretty similar. And then the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. So again, we have a difference in role. In, in the Armenian, it's about the Lord's right hand. And of course, we know the right hand is significant in many ways. Um, versus the Lord shading you or sheltering you on your right hand. And lastly, not a great difference, but we just have a little bit of a, a difference in ordering in the last verse, whereas in the Armenian, coming, you're coming in and you're going out are reversed from what we have in the English. So just, just to notice some of these um, little differences. So I wanted to, with now having looked at a psalm, we've heard it chanted, we've heard a version of a Sharagan that's composed um, to coincide with it. I wanted to take a look at one of our exegetes that we're going to be looking at over the course of this semester. And that is our friend Vartan Arabeltsi, or Vartan the Great. Um, and so we're going to be looking at how he interpreted the psalm that we just heard and read. Um, and in order to do that, I wanted to share with you what his approach to scripture commentary, his approach of scripture interpretation was. And it's not unique to him. This uh, apparatus that we're going to look at right now um, is very ancient. It pre it pre exists Christian interpretation. This was very much a part of um, Jewish scripture interpretation, and it was assimilated by the Armenian Church as well as the other ancient churches, and it continued in to be the way scripture was interacted with. So this comes from, I believe, it was from his introduction to the Song of Songs. I'm getting a nod from the expert here. Um, it is known that Holy Writ is interpreted in four fashions. First, it is explained carnally, according to its factuality and actuality. So this is the first very surface level. You think of, you know, our marmin is our surface, right? So it's the first level of interpretation, the very basic. Second, spiritually, according to the vision of the mind. Third, in a specific manner, according to the situation. 
and fourth, allegorically and following a higher mode of interpretation. And I think it's important to note here that you can gain from scripture vastly at any of these levels. And we as readers and uh, receivers of scripture, we may never enter the second, third, or fourth levels. We may, but if we don't, it does not mean that we're not fully reaping benefits from our interaction with scripture. So, um, you know, for those of us who have a passing interest in scripture, we may stay around the first level. For those of us that are willing to exert a little bit of work, we may go to the second or third. And for those of us that are really willing to, to put forth the efforts, um, we may get to dip into that fourth level. And uh, from an Armenian perspective, much of this may have to do with our command of scripture. Uh, we can't find connections if we don't have the building blocks. So I can't connect the words in the Psalms with um, the prophets or with Christ's words if I don't have a good foundation in those books. And just as I revealed earlier tonight, um, I've been saying words from the Psalms for many years, and it was only in recent years that I came to know that they were from the Psalms. And I'm sure that exercise for me is not yet done. There are probably other examples that will pop up. Um, and so it's, you know, it's really up to each of us to decide you know, what do we want our relationship with scripture to be? Um, and there's not a one size fits all answer. And so I think it's really, I think it's really beautiful that for each of us, whatever level we're at, whatever level we're willing to invest in our relationship with scripture, there are fruits for each of us, you know, that the Holy Spirit waits for each of us um, and waits to reveal those fruits to us. So I, just to go a little bit into, a little more in depth into these, these four levels, he, Vartan starts with this most basic level, which we would say in our parlance is the literal context of the passage. It looks at the actual events of the passage and their meaning for the initial hearers of a passage. So in our study of the Psalms, this means what was the context of the Psalm that we are reading? What was the context it was written in? Um, and we get little clues to this, at least uh, what people would like us to, to connect as the events uh, that the Psalms were written for based on the headings of the Psalms in Armenian, for one, which often tell us um, a Psalm of David in this circumstance or um, we have one about the being on the banks of the river in Babylon. These kinds of references give us a little bit of a, an insight. And then sometimes within the Psalms themselves, we see the, that first initial layer of um, context. So next, he goes to the intellectual lever, level. Um, so looking beneath the surface, the anagog anagog anagogical level um, where deeper meaning is sought out and then that third level has to do with we are hearers of the scripture as much as people hearing it in the first generation of it being written so the psalms are not just a historical book for us to look at they are living and this is something i think is really important when we're talking about scripture we are interacting with something that is alive. We are not interacting with ink and paper. We are at interacting with the pan astuzo, the word, the living word of God. So when we hear these words from the Psalms, the, the words we heard before, we were hearing the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Now, we whether we had the ability to... Um, interpret that, whether we have the ability to understand that. You know, obviously, classical Armenian is none of our first languages. Um, 
But we have that opportunity when we hear scripture to interpret it for our circumstances. And we do that, I suspect, you know, what we're going through. If we're, if we read the book of Psalms, if you've read through the book of Psalms and you're going through something difficult, chances are there are verses, there are Psalms that will come to mind that will fit with your circumstances. And that, again, is one of the benefits of having a deep grounding in Scripture and in the Psalms in particular, is that if we know the Psalms, lines from the Psalms will come to us when we need them. And when we need a word from the Lord, chances are the right word will come to us. So this third level, again, it's it's an opportunity for us as listeners today to respond to scripture and to apply it to our own lives and our circumstances. And then this fourth level is the most perhaps slippery, um, the most difficult one to really apprehend, and that's the level of allegory. And... Uh, I confess I'm not an expert in this fourth level, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. I, I leave that to those much more expert in this than me. But I think it's important for us to know that there is this fourth level um, that's understood to be uh, a bit more complexly concealed um, and to have an even deeper meaning than that second layer. Um, and it's a universal uh, deeper meaning that we can, again, with, with deep study um, apprehend. So, Vartan was tasked with writing this commentary on the book of Psalms. And he has a very lengthy and valuable introduction that he's provided us with. And so I wanted to share a few excerpts from this translation that was so beautifully done by Dr. Irvin, to give you a sense of how he understood what he understood the book of Psalms to be and what his approach was. And they did not set for us the task of walking an untrodden path through a waterless wilderness. In other words, the task of working on an unworked book, but rather the Psalms of David the spirit and life of rational beings, which we know by tasting them densely and without ceasing day and night. So obviously this is a reference probably to the corporate use of Psalms, but possibly also his own personal devotion. Many travelers have cut paths here in the interpretation of the Psalms. And like birds flying on the wings of the spirit, the spirit-bearing fathers have shown the way above and below. Athanasius, Epiphanius, Ephraim, Daniel, and later Nersus, understood to be Lampronazi. And we will, of course, be looking at some of these authors, uh, commentators throughout the course of this semester. For this reason, trusting in God who took me from the dung heap and in the divine fathers, we undertook to set, set the words of the fathers in proximity to one another in a single volume. So all of these earlier commentators, Bartan is telling us he is he's trying to um, condense and combine so that we can have them all together in one, one book. We've sometimes abbreviated their more expansive words in line with our preferences for brevity in this impatient time. And sometimes sharing in the patristic inspiration through their prayers, we shall hear their put things as the Lord may grant us, or to clarify their ancient wisdom's obscurity. And it's important to remember that he is not writing this for every person. This is not a text that you're going to find at Barnes & Noble for your reading pleasure. He was creating a tool for teachers to use. So given the high level of learning that his students would have had, and this is over the course of decades, they would not need him to spell out every single word, every single thought. He gives them as prompts, and then these can be built out by the learned teacher. So if he were to produce this 
for you and me today, I suspect it would look very different in how he might do that. Placing hope in the fathers and gathering flowers formed by the spirit in the valley fields, their hearts and lips, we shall bind into a colorful and multi-fragrant bouquet those things that we find readily. I share that because I just think it's such a beautiful image of his process of editing this work. And, you know, I think what he sought to do, it's just such a beautiful thing to think about and to think about, to, to really um, have the opportunity to, to smell the fragrance of this bouquet that he's provided for us. Uh, you know, a, a, a bouquet of flowers, I, I would venture to say, is, is much less of a labor to put together. Yes, it's a labor to put together artfully um, and aesthetically, but in terms of what he did here in creating this compendium of interpretations on the Psalms, um, that's really a huge labor of love. And he's offering it to us. And we shall put them in your hands, O children of Zion, so that you may ever fall into the embrace of the Holy Church, into the joyful caresses of her immortal bridegroom, Jesus, and to you, children of the bridal chamber, for your enjoyment of the heavenly dance. And through your entreaties, may it be for us a store of good and the substance of God's compassion and mercy. So it's clear that he sees the Psalms as integral and important for the life of anyone who's part of the church. That we may fall into the embrace of the church, that we may, we may fall in love with our Savior. And here we have this reference that comes up um, certainly in Badarak, you know, children of the bridal chamber, that's you and me. And I love this image of the enjoyment of the heavenly dance. How often do we remember that there is a heavenly dance that we are being invited into? And here we get a little bit of his insight into who David, as the understood author of the Psalms, was and what David's approach was. So according to David named Thrice Great, and a man who was a bearer of the spirit, near to God, and speaking of God, his psalms are to be understood thus. The undefined divine elements of speech formed within the souls of just men, scribing the good things or the wrath that is expected to come. These are called prophecy, that is foreseeing. And because the divine cannot be seen by those with sight, in terms of its self-existent nature, it was translated by the speech of these of those holy men. So this is a really heady statement, but basically what he's saying is that which was uh, beyond our comprehension was being translated for us, for our benefit, through the likes of David, prophetically. And here we have it in front of us in the book of Psalms. Now, some of them, some of the Psalms, by divine influence, reveal the nature of things that are past, while others do the same for things in the future, and still others for the present. And I think it's worth mentioning again the Armenian concept of time. We have this spiral of time, and we revisit events and uh, in different ways, and come back, um, and is in in the presence of God is there any separation between past, present, and future? There is no time. So all of these exist um, consubstantially at the same time. In past times, they ex exhorted, legislated, and warned. They were instructed in the divine commandments. So we hear, it sounds like he's suggesting that prophecy has moved away from those types of um, exhortations, legislations, and warnings into the language of the Psalms. 
Where is this David, a Bethlehemite, son of Jesse, was glorified by attaining to a greater grace, and like the sun amid the stars, he has shown yet he show he has shown yet more resplendent than they. He shown yes. shone yet more resplendent than they. It was a little like he was eager to eclipse them. As it says, if there are prophecies, they will be eclipsed. And if there are tongues, they shall be silenced as earthly things. Only dancing with the ranks of angels in praise of God will be recognized as an eternal art that does not pass away. Again, we have this reference to this divine dance. It was in this very God-given grace that he immersed himself. As he says in Psalm 144, I will exalt you, my God and my King. For he did not have the spirit of prophecy in order to prophesy to humanity, but rather the spirit of kingship in order to bless with joyful praise the King of kings alone, the monarch of heaven. As he says in the 67th Psalm, O kingdoms of earth, bless God, say psalms to the Lord, arisen to the heavens of heavens with alleluias. So we'll pause there for a moment. That was a lot to take in, and I will leave this up um, if anybody would like to just look at this and, and take it in. We'll have a five-minute, ten-minute break. So we'll be back at ten after eight to continue. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. So I just have a little bit more to share, and then I will be handing over the screen to Dr. Irvin. So I promised you earlier that we would come back to um, the um, idea of, of seven and what, it, what is, um, why it's significant for our study of the Psalms. So here we're going to look at, um, this is again from the, from Vartan's introduction. So it says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David as king, calling him as if the matter were accomplished. And the spirit moved upon him from that day forward. And then having received the spirit, David created songs of blessing to God with God given wisdom melodies of sweet psalms in various aspects so that not only in words but also with the sound of melodious song he make the due primal rational offerings daily bringing to the lord ancient things and their future fruits so vatan's letting us in on his understanding of how and why david created the psalms he was so overcome by warm and enthusiastic love for God that he was not sufficed with his own natural rational voice for praise. But he took in hand wood and gut and skillfully made an instrument for praise so that with the living fingers of his hands, through the reverberation of the instrument joined together with the word, he would make the divine song all the more beautiful and thereby pleasing to the Spirit in accordance with the sevenfold grace of the Spirit that had first come upon him and rested on him as a type, as the flower sprung from the root of Jesse and the budded rod of Aaron. He was the beginning of kingship from the tribe of Judah. Making the seven-stringed harp, David played to the Lord seven times a day. Huh. We have seven daily services. This is no coincidence. This was the legacy of the sevenfold graces which his son Jesus gives to his church in order that they may reign together with him in the perfect eternal kingdom. Because of this mystery, David also made another instrument with ten strings in accordance with the perfect number, the decad, with the same meaning of ultimate completion. Its use by the saints led to it being called a psaltery. In other words, an instrument that some mistakenly believe to have been a lyre. These two instruments, these two are the instruments of David with which he made the Holy Spirit audible always before the Lord. 
So he used these instruments to make the Holy Spirit audible. He gave voice to the Holy Spirit through his own voice. Also, as has been said, the seven-stringed harp indicated the sevenfold grace of the Spirit, which coming upon a human being completely spiritualized his spirit and soul and body, thus fulfilling the decad, which was signified by the ten-stringed psaltery in praise of the Lord. So presumably Vartan wanted to somehow make sense of the fact that we have two instruments that are known to be psalteries. One had seven strings, one had ten. Why did we have two instruments? Well, here's one explanation for how those came about. And we're going to now just have a very small taste of um, how Vartan interpreted the psalm that we've been looking at tonight, Psalm 120. So we'll look at the first verse together. So we have here the verse itself. I raise my eyes to the mountains, whence help shall come to me. And Vartan says about this, in Zion and in Samiran, whence they numbered help, whence came Habakkuk by an angel, and brought food to Daniel. And we are higher than all heavens and in the heaven of heavens, whence Jesus came and is coming, the helper of our weakness. So you have here the verse, I raise my eyes to the mountains. And Vartan tells us here which mountains people have been looking at. So we have those who are looking to Zion, those who are looking to Samiron, Presumably where apparently Habakkuk was brought by the angel, by his top knot, and taken to Daniel in Babylon. And we, we don't just look to Zion or Samiron. We look higher than all the heavens. We look to the mountains that are above the heaven of heavens, from where Jesus came and is coming. And in Armenian, the words um, call to mind of course, the Balarak words, Ornyal Yegyal Anbaugyar, Ornyal Borkalotse, the helper of our weakness. So I will leave you with that for the moment. And I, I put to you, when you are in trouble and you're needing help, remember that we collectively, we, we look up to the mountains that are above the heavens where Christ our help is waiting who has come who is coming and who is to come and with that I will turn this over to Dr. Irvin right so we're going to take a closer look at a little bit of what Deacon Yervant has been talking about. And I want to look at the psalm through the lens of those four uh, different types of exegesis, four types of interpretation that he spoke about earlier um, from a slightly different language, from a slightly different angle, because why, after all, would you need four levels four different types of interpretation. Well, you may actually you may actually have noticed it in that last slide. That's a rather odd interpretation. That's a very strange thing. We have Mount Zion, we have another mountain, we have things that are up, and there's nothing that really seems to hold these things together. Why is it that way? Why don't the Armenian commentators just tell us what they mean? Well, it actually depends a bit on who is the us that would be asking that question. Why don't the Armenian commentators just tell us what they mean? So I want to give you a really ridiculously simple example of why they might not. So I don't know what your memories are of learning to read, but this is a great way to get a child engaged in reading. You have people who are advanced readers, 
parents in this case, helping the child, the beginner, the person who doesn't yet know what's going on but is intrigued by it, to sound out words. Maybe they read a story to the child. This is a very appropriate thing to do, and I expect all of our parents or our teachers were engaged in this for us at some time in our life. This is also a very appropriate way to go about reading and teaching to read. You see in the middle, there's a slightly more advanced peer engaging two slightly less advanced peers <laughs> and introducing them to the wonders of books and written words and that connection that there is between what you see on the page and what you hear with your ears. Maybe we all had a time in life when this was the case as well. And then there's this, a very appropriate moment in a more advanced stage of learning where you have an expert introducing more learned people to manuscripts that are a different kind of reading. They require a different skill set. They're a rare medium compared to other things. And to approach them, to use them, to read them, to enjoy them is a rather different task than simply enjoying a nice book. So far, all of that is good. There's an appropriate transfer of learning, an appropriate drawing in of this little audience, whatever it is, into the joys of the possibilities that you get with writing. However, if you become a manuscript specialist and you're pre presenting something at a conference of other manuscript specialists, perhaps going to something like this lovely conference from 2023, the people in the audience might very well appreciate it if you share with them interesting manuscript things that they haven't had a chance to see before. But no one in that audience of specialists is going to be pleased if you get up and start your presentation by telling them what a manuscript is and why it's important. And God forbid you were to sit down on the floor and tell them to gather around you while you showed them words on the manuscript page and you sounded them out for them. Best case scenario is that they're going to think you're insane. It's the same way with reading and discussing commentaries. Audience matters. So do other things, of course. We might get to some of those at a later time. But for now, we're going to think about audience. What's appropriate to a specific audience? So in order to help us situate Bhattan's commentary on the Psalms. As Yervon has suggested, we're going to be spending significant time with it in our upcoming sessions. In order to contextualize that and to prepare our minds to use it properly, to use it appropriately, let's see what we can determine about his audience. When he produced this commentary, what did Vartan assume that they knew already? How did he think they would want to upgrade their understanding or their learning or their ability to present? And we'll use the same Psalm that we started with this evening, Psalm 120. And we're gonna look at just one verse because I think it will be enough to make the point. On the slide, you see three different commentaries on the same verse from the same psalm. 
And we're going to start, I think, with the Psalm commentary on the right. It's part of a piece from a blog called Rethink Now or Rethink No. I guess you could do it either way. It's a very clever little title. It's produced by a young pastor, church planter in Colorado. His name is Jeffrey Curtis Poor. He's been in ministry, his introduction says, about a dozen years. He has a growing young family. He tells us in his introductory material that he was trained at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri. So that puts him in a very specific context. And that he went on for a master's degree, not there, although they had one available, but at a larger Christian university in Virginia called Regent. So remembering that second verse, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's see what he says about it. Verse 2, the one we just said, quickly answers the question that's asked in the first verse. Because, of course, for Western uh, interpreters, that first verse is a question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where is my help coming from? Not for Armenian, but for them. So verse 2 quickly answers the question asked in the first verse. My help comes from the Lord. The psalmist is reminding himself that his help is from the one who made those mountains. All those other things we place our hope in only let us down. They cannot help us. It's God alone who our help comes from. This is what the Israelites would dwell on as they traversed towards the temple. It is not the mountains that provide, but God. This flies in the face of what culture tells us. It tells us our help comes from the government. It comes from within ourselves. It comes from connecting with nature. And the three dots are his. But it doesn't. Our help comes from the Lord. So, who is his audience? What does he expect them to know about scripture before reading his article? Actually, he doesn't expect them to know anything. Is what he says comprehensible? Yes, it is. Will it connect with someone who's reading this blog living their life and starting to wonder whether things are going as well as they could, whether they might in fact need some help in getting where they wish to be in their existence. I think it does. I think it would connect with such a person. On the other hand, would this blog entry satisfy one of his colleagues who might have to teach or preach on this verse? Probably not. Saying, don't rely on anything but God is an invitation to think about the other things that we usually rely on in life that are unsatisfactory. But this particular blog Peace, does not move the reader any farther into scripture than he or she already was. It's an initial connection piece. It's a, is scripture relevant to your situation piece? It's not a come and learn more piece. And his conclusions, legitimate though they may be, doesn't go beyond the fact that they are his conclusions. There's a shortage of support 
or argumentation or logic or any of those other things that you might look for if you are already involved in the Christian scene. And from reading his blog, you would have no idea that this verse that he's commenting on was ever written in any other language. It's purely in English. This is purely for an English speaking, very beginning audience that needs to be invited to think about its own situation just a little bigger. Not that there's anything wrong with this. There are enough beginners out there. That's quite a different thing from the middle commentary. Again, just on this one verse. It's a commentary from a website of resources for preachers. I actually recommend it. It's got some good stuff on it. The website is run by Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And the writer, Nancy de Classe Walford, is a professor of Old Testament and biblical languages at the McAfee School of Theology attached to Mercer University in Atlanta. So let's read this one as well and see what is she expecting from her audience that Jeffrey Poor was not? What is she offering to her audience that he was not? And why? All right. The word helper, God is my help. My help comes from the Lord. And then she puts in the Hebrew of it, azir, is derived from a verbal root that means to help, to free, or to come to help. It's a powerfully simple word. It's used in Genesis 2.18 where we read, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the human should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. As it occurs in its noun form, some 65 times in the Old Testament, and in most cases, it refers to the help of God in some sort of life-threatening situation. For example, Exodus 18.4, Deuteronomy 33.26, Psalm 33.20. Thus, the word azir conveys the idea of a help that is a strong presence, an aid without which humankind would be unprotected and vulnerable to all sorts of unsettling situations. The phrase, maker of heavens and earth, appears three times in the song of, Songs of Ascents, Psalm 121, 124, and 134, and in Psalm 146, verse 6. Its earliest occurrence in the biblical text is in the blessing of Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 19. The phrase was incorporated into the Apostles' Creed with the words, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Well, that's a different animal altogether from the first interpretation. Dr. Walford's audience is clearly not made up of beginners just starting to think about whether scripture or Christianity has any relevance to their lives, whether there's anything in it that they can understand or that could upgrade their life. This is for preachers who have seminary education behind them. An intermediate audience, so to speak. In other words, they want to learn more. They want to build on what they got in their three years at seminary. And she expects them, first of all, to be interested in the original text. She expects them to have some concern about where things came from. And she counts on them knowing some Hebrew, not a lot, enough to get around in a concordance or in a biblical dictionary. 
She expects them to know just enough about the Hebrew underlayment of the psalm that she can offer them this interesting little word study that will add to their understanding of God as help. God is help. She throws them this, this lovely little thing that Eve was made for help. And it seems like she thinks she can count on her audience to know what is found in those references in the second paragraph. She expects them to understand what's in Exodus 18.4. It happens to be the place where the name of Moses's son, Eleazar, is explained. She expects them to be familiar with Deuteronomy 33.26 which is the dying Jacob's last blessing of his son Asher with the promise of divine help. And she expects them to have access to Psalm 32, where God is described as a help specifically in a time of famine and death. And as it's pointed out there, horses and other things are not particularly helpful in that kind of a situation. And if she can't really count on her audience to know those verses and those stories, at least she can count on them to look them up. And so she gives them a summary of what can be derived from those different verses that adds to the understanding of the Psalm second verse. And then you can tell in the third paragraph that she's from a liturgical church, a Lutheran, perhaps. So she tells her audience that it would be worthwhile connecting the phrase maker of heaven and earth to the creed, and that if you put all of these other things as kind of background to that, it's going to enrich your sermon if you choose to go that direction. And then she connects the creed back to the Psalms, pointing out that the phrase maker of heaven and earth is used in three different Psalms that all belong to the same group as this little Psalm, the Psalms of Ascent. And then she also notices on their behalf that the, that the, this is the same in Genesis 14. There's a strange little vignette. Because it's very, very short, perhaps, she specifically mentions that it has to do with the enigmatic figure of Melchizedek, king of Salem. And having said that, she assumes that her audience will know that the letter to the Hebrews spends three chapters expanding on Melchizedek as an Old Testament archetype of Christ. In other words, this very interesting commentary on the psalm, maybe for the 22nd week after Pentecost in the Lutheran tradition, is aimed at an audience of biblically literate people who want to add meat to their preaching. They want to put some oomph behind their preaching by learning something new, by learning something, by making some connections that will nourish themselves and their own spirits. And it's out of that that their upcoming homilies will grow. She doesn't expect her readers her audience, to use her commentary verbatim in a sermon. She does expect that they'll use information from it as it is appropriate to their congregations, their audiences. And if you think back to Egan Yervant's fashions of interpretation, appropriateness to an audience is one level of that. So a preacher could use her material in order to do a homily on help 
or to do a historical contextual sermon on ascent. She's just in the little piece before I excerpted it here, does a little contextualization on the ascent to Jerusalem, the ascent to the temple. Alternatively, the preacher could do a nice series, use what she says as part of the series on the meaning of the creed. So she has opened up new doors for her audience to upgrade what they already know, and then to use that knowledge in different ways to upgrade the understanding of their various audiences, whoever they are. So a beginner's piece, an intermediate piece. And now we look at Vatan. His commentary on this verse is the shortest. You can see it's got the biggest print there too. Let me read it and think about what he is assuming his audience knows. The one who fabricated Husniats, this house, whose ceiling is heaven and whose floor is the earth, is able in all things. He is present everywhere. Again, whether an angel comes from heaven or a prophet and an apostle, any human being, whatever, from the earth, that help is from the Lord, who created us as heavenly and earthly, who created us as the link between the two. Hmm. So Vartan clearly assumes, you just listen to that, there is no resemblance between that and either of the two that came before it. Obviously, he is assuming from the outset his audience does not need either an introductory thought process on life or an intermediate word study. He's writing his commentary for people who are beyond both those levels. He's writing his commentary for very advanced students. They already know what a Psalm of Ascents is. They know which Psalms fall in that category. They know what help means when it refers to God. They know all of the relevant verses that connect God and help. They can already work with those things. And they have already spent time dissecting and reassembling that creedal phrase, maker of heaven and earth, they don't need that. It's not that that stuff isn't important. It's just that they have already been there. Students who made it into Vartan's classes were already teachers. They were already specialists. They had already put in 10 or 12 years learning about the scriptures, their historical context, the text itself. They had studied it in Greek and Hebrew, perhaps also Syriac. Vartan was adept in languages. Vartan made sure that they did those things. They did not need to be told the meaning of the word help. In addition to all of that, they had already read a lot of commentary on the Psalms, as well as other patristic texts that could be applied to or had something to do with the Psalms. So what Vartan offers them here in this very succinct little pair of, uh, pair of interpretations of this verse is just the icing on the interpretive cake. Or if we're gonna use the, the other way of looking at it, the allegorical, in other words, the aisle, the different interpretation. He also offers them he doesn't force it on them, but he offers them a little bit more controversial or esoteric or challenging idea in order to kick their understanding up a notch or to open their minds to the idea that the meanings of scriptures are many layered and you have you may be extremely learned, but there is always more. There is always something more for you. There are always new dimensions to explore. Since he talks about a house here, maybe we should say there are always new rooms in your life. 
in your brain, in your heart, in your spirit that will be made more livable, more comfortable, even more luxurious when they're filled with the high quality furniture of the scriptures. So let's look at this just a little bit. The first thing that Vartan's very advanced audience would have noticed is the oddness of that first sentence. The one who built this house, what house? <laughs> Where the heck did a house come from? We were talking about mountains. It's not immediately obvious where that comes from. So what is he doing? Where is he extrapolating the hills, the mountains, whatever, the Jerusalem that they're going up to, whatever it is, what is he extrapolating that to? And they would also notice immediately, their Armenian was quite good, right? That Vartan does not use any of the normal words for building. He could have said, Garutzanem. He could have said shinem, he could have used arnem, he could have used sterzem, create, make without effort, build, structure, but he didn't. He used a really weird word, husniats. You might translate perhaps as fabricated. And his audience would immediately be fixated on that word. Why did he use that word? Why not any of the other normal words that we have? There are plenty of them. Nothing of what Abed said was random. So they knew it wasn't just that he felt like showing off his vocabulary. And the audience, even more importantly, maybe, knew already that the word husnem is not in scripture. So what's he doing with that? And that all of the derivatives of this root, Hewson, are almost always negative when they appear in scripture. So what the heck is he doing? Why is he using that thing? In addition to their deep knowledge of scripture and its vocabulary, Vartan's audience at this level, we're also very familiar with a wide range of patristic texts. They were especially well-versed in the thinking of a group of fifth century fathers Cap from Cappadocia, AKA Armenia Minor, who were related to one another, either by blood or by friendship or by both. Their names are Gregory Bishop of Nazianzus, Basil Bishop of Caesarea, and Basil's brother, Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa. Very, three very different, very fascinating human beings. And so an advanced student, such as the ones in this audience, would surely have studied Gregory of Nyssa's best known work, which is titled On the Formation of Man. But Vartan isn't quoting from it. Instead, he is dropping into this interpretation a little tiny gem for that excellent student, that rare student who had gone the extra mile and had read more of Nyssa's corpus than he had to in order to contextualize and flesh out what he was learning in class. That most excellent student would recognize that the word husnem was used once and only once in the Armenian translation of Gregory of Nyssa's other work on virginity, which is not where you would think to look for anything having to do with, with building. It's used in chapter 12 of On Virginity, and it's used in a situation where Gregory is describing what we might call today fabrications. I think we could do quite a lot with, with this little thread of thought. Gregory is describing the kind of thing that humans do that is like God, 
and yet not quite like God. He says, yes, human beings are like God. Part of the image of God is our creativity. But he says, it's a special kind of creativity. God creates in a way that is immediate and requires no effort. He arnels things. Humans, on the other hand, have a creative ability to fabricate things in exactly the way that we would mean it if we were saying it now today. The line in Gregory says, Kusnelen martumiainko. Fabricating, the ability to fabricate, exists only for human beings or it belongs only to human beings. Angels and animals don't have the ability to Husnel any more than humans have the ability to Arnel, to make something from nothing with no effort. So, in On Virginity, Gregory says, God did not create evil, I think, and out of nothing. Humans fabricated it. They were surrounded by everything good and beautiful. And from that goodness and beauty, they fabricated the option of evil. So, Vartan implies, in this house created by God, humans make their own fabrications. In the same sentence, Vartan describes the house where fabrication happens as having the heaven for a ceiling and the earth for a floor. The idea of the cosmos as a dwelling place for humans and animals is a very ancient idea. Any educated or semi-educated audience had probably heard this metaphor, and so an advanced student could easily use that as a teaching metaphor. The world is our house, the two realms in which we function as humans. It's very nice. But Vartan describes this house using very specific wording. He calls it this house whose ceiling, Tserun, is the heavens and whose floor, Hadag, is the earth. We could also talk about the word Tserun because he's doing quite a bit with that, but we're not going to. Um, well, it's just for fun. It shows up in the story of the ark. It's the thing that Noah opens to let the birds out and in. Anyway, this house whose ceiling is the heavens and whose floor is the earth, that description is a direct quote from the 5th century Armenian father, Yeznik of Golp, one of the holy translators. It comes from his book, Teaching Armenian Priests and Teachers and Missionaries, what ideas they were likely to encounter in the people that they spoke to, their flock, their students, whatever it was. And the book shows them counter arguments, how to combat those ideas that they'll be hearing with Christian ones. And the quote, this house whose ceiling is the heavens and whose floor is the earth, is part of Yeznik's discussion of good and evil. Good created by God and evil fabricated by humans together have created this house in which we live. They have, God has created it, we have formed it. God has made it with no effort and we take its elements and fabricate something new out of them. God has created for humans a house that is massive and beautiful and spacious and humans have chosen to use its good things to fabricate the opposite to make the house less habitable rather than to adorn it suitably for the comfort of all who reside within it. And there's more to this. Vartan brings in a New Testament parable, a saying by Jesus, a play on a grammatical term, the word conjunction, shock up, uh, link, and the different meanings of that will lead in all different directions. Conjunctions join equal things. So 
There's an equality implied between heaven and earth and so on and so forth. In other words, in this little snippet of commentary here, Vartan offers his advanced students doors to the deeper or the more esoteric or the aisle, the allegorical, the things that are done in a different manner. But he does it subtly enough that you're not forced to go there. Unless you think about the word fabricated, you're not forced to go into good and evil and how they have affected the house in which we live, for example. People could be fine staying with the idea that because God has created this two-level space for humans, everything that brings us help, whether it comes from heaven or earth, comes from him. And a teacher or a preacher could certainly unpack that idea in a whole series of sermons. Because after all, all of us, everyone, learned or not learned, has experienced help at the hands of other humans, be they prophets, apostles, or whatever other being, as he says. And everyone has had some kind of an encounter with heavenly intervention. So, in the centuries leading up to the Cilician period, as Yervant said, this multi-layered interpretation given in a very, very succinct form is characteristic of how Armenians do commentary. Written for the most advanced, these commentaries assumed a lot of prior learning, an openness to deeper levels of meaning, that the user who recognized those levels was invited to literally cook up, much as one prepares bread or a meal, for the hungry audiences that they would face of all different capacities and levels of accomplishment while at the same time allowing themselves to be nourished by these more exotic foods. So basically what we're going to be doing with the rest of the semester as we look at how the Psalms and the liturgies work together and then how the understandings in the commentaries help to inform what people are thinking about as they perform these things liturgically, what we're going to be doing is effectively we're going to be sneaking into the back of a classroom so to speak, in a good Varta Bedaran. And we're going to hang out there invisibly. But it means we're going to have to work on ourselves. We're going to have to work on our level of learning, on our ability to bring together threads, on our ability to dig deeper, on our word study and language skills, because after all, Vartan assumes you have them already. It takes effort, in other words, to widen our understanding of how people who came before us have added rooms to the house that God has built for us so that we will have the opportunity to fabricate in it good, not evil. That we will have the opportunity to produce nourishment, not just empty calories, 